Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 4. Say, I don't know where it is. Just go to Matthew and go backwards. You'll hit it. You'll go through Malachi. You'll get there. Don't worry about it. And I'm going to go to Galatians chapter 5 to our text verse. Again, this is a series entitled Walking in the Spirit. This is uh, number 7 in that series. And today's message is entitled, By My Spirit Says the Lord. Everybody say that with me one time. By my spirit says the Lord. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 is our text. And Paul says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's a promise right there. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And that's a good thing. You don't want to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You want to walk victoriously in the Spirit. That's God's plan for your life. That's exactly how you want to live. So say, I'm victorious victorious. in the Spirit of God. God. Now, are you in Zechariah 4? If you're there, say, I'm there. there. Zechariah 4, verse 6. And so he answered and said unto me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. It was funny this week as I was getting ready for Sunday service, usually by Friday. I'm pretty well tuned up and ready. I know what God is uh, speaking to my heart and the direction that I believe the service should go in. And so Friday, I'm usually collecting my thoughts and notes and and, uh, getting ready for Sunday. And then Saturday, just kind of putting polishing touches and and getting things uh, set. But Friday, I did not know what we were to minister on Sunday and uh, I thought, Lord, this would be a good time to tell me, and, and he didn't. And, and so the day went on Friday, and I just thought, you know, what, what's going to be the message for Sunday? And so I pulled out my book on 101 messages for Pentecostal preachers. And uh, no, that's not true. There's no such book. And so I prayed, and I believed, and uh, there isn't such a book, is there? If there is, why are you holding out on me? I could have really used that book. Um, but anyways, I prayed and I believed and, and throughout the day, I just didn't get a, a revelation of God. And, and so I went to bed trusting the Lord. And I said, Lord, you just have to speak to my heart because I need to know what we're ministering on Sunday. You see, I thought the walking in the spirit series was done last week. I wanted the new revelation. What's the new series? What, what's the message for this Sunday? Well, When I woke up on Saturday morning, ringing in my spirit was this phrase, shout grace, grace unto it, grace, grace unto it. And as soon as that went off in my spirit, I said, I I get it. So I went straight to Zechariah 4, and here we find it in Zechariah 4, with shouts of grace, the capstone is placed with shouts of grace, grace unto it. Now... Let's understand the setting here in this passage because there are several folks we need to be aware of. Zerubbabel that we're talking about here, before Zerubbabel it shall become a great plain. Uh, This is what the, the passage is referencing, a man, a governor by the name of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was in charge of rebuilding the temple after the captivity of Babylon. You understand that the children, the northern ten tribes of Israel were carried away by the Assyrians in in, uh, 720 B.C. And then the southern two tribes of Israel were carried away by the Babylonians. Well, 70 years passed and they came back and they were going to rebuild the temple and Zerubbabel was in charge of that. Well, they laid the foundation and then there was opposing voices. The Samaritans wanted to be involved and the Samaritans were rebuked by the Israelites and said, no, you can't be involved. And so they raised a big fuss and construction stopped. And construction stopped for 14 years. 
And then a prophet came on site, and the prophet was Zechariah. And then another prophet came on site, and the prophet was Haggai. And they started prophesying to the nation, why have you stopped? And my house shall be built, says the Lord. And so after 14 years of doing nothing, they picked up the ministry again of building the tabernacle or the temple, I should say, and it took them four years to complete it. Now, the revelation to me, someone who is in the ministry, is when you take the 14 years of doing nothing and then the additional four years it takes to complete them, I realize it took them 18 years to do what they could have done in four years. I don't want that to be my ministry. I don't want that to be my life. I don't want to take 18 years to do what can be done in four years. In fact, I don't want to take four years to do what can be done in four years. I want to do four years in two years. I want to do two years in one year. Come on, say amen. If you remember Bishop Tony's prophecy over this church, he said what you'll do in five years can be done in three years, and three years in 18 months. I said, praise the Lord. I believe God has this church on a plan of acceleration. How else do you explain what God is doing in this church? How do you pay off a church in 14 months? Plan of acceleration. How do you pay for the youth building in a couple of months? A plan of acceleration. I believe God has a plan of acceleration for this church. I want to see it done. And I want to see it done quickly. And I want to be a part of the last revival before Jesus comes back. I want, to touch the, I want to touch every corner of this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to be part of it. I don't want to be on the sidelines. And I certainly don't want to be of the mindset when God has called us to do something that we start and then we lay it down. And then 14 years later we try and figure out, well, what are we doing here? Because God has sent a remnant back to Jerusalem to build the temple. And 14 years later, they had to figure out, what are we doing here? Why did we even come back here? Come on, say amen. Amen. I've known too many ministries and too many ministers and too many Christians, too many believers that have let a decade go by and two decades go by and more than that go by until they finally realize, hey, wait a second, I had a call on my life 10 years ago and 20 years ago and I need to get busy about that. Hey, I don't want to stand before Jesus Christ and give an answer of why I didn't do something. No, I want to stand before the Lord and say I gave it my very best. I tried with everything that is within me, with every breath in my body, with every ounce of strength that is within me. I believe big with you, Lord. I saw a global vision. I didn't have small thoughts and small vision and small effort and small anything. I believe big with you, Lord. Lord, you said that you could do abundantly above all that I could ask or think. You said that you would put me in a church that would believe with me for the world. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I don't want today to be just a history lesson. I want today to be a spiritual application. And I believe there's a a message in here for the church. For the church of Jesus Christ. Because the prophet had to stand up and stir the people to get busy about what God had called them to and get past a point of discouragement in their life where opposition simply overwhelmed them and they gave up what they were doing. In fact, they not only gave up what they were doing, they started using the material set aside for the building of the temple to build their own houses. God said, why are you living in chiseled houses when my house has gone unbuilt? Oh, come on, church. You don't want God to say that to you. You don't want God to say, why are you busy about your life when my calling is going unnoticed? Come on, church. Say amen. This is where I really need the amen corner. Someone lock the doors. I want my amen corner right now. All right. Praise the Lord. Are you still in Zechariah? Amen. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 16. So this is a message 
that Zechariah was speaking to a disheartened people. And I think it is so easily easy to become disheartened in the things of the Lord. And, and uh, I want to encourage you today. The enemy wants to discourage you, but Debbie and I want to encourage you. We want to put courage into you that God's calling is still active on your life. He still has a plan for you. He still has a purpose for you. And he is going to see it come to pass. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Zechariah 1 and 16, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built. Now, that is a statement of declaration. My house shall be built. This is what he's saying through the prophet. My house, this temple, is going to be built. Everybody say that with me one time. My house shall be built. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem, again proclaiming, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, my city shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord again comforts Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. Now, just so that we don't end up in a history lesson, let's make the spiritual application. If God says, my house shall be built, what is his house today? It says in 1 Corinthians 3, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is the house of God now. If you're a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. So you are the temple of of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of... So when I hear God say something like this, He says, my house shall be built. I say, God, build this house. Build this life. Build this ministry. Build me up. I, come on, are you with me today? I want you to have a life built on the principles of God, built on the promises of God, built on the favor of God and the blessings of God and the overcoming power of God, built on the anointing of God, built on the revelation of God, built on the word of God. I want you to be able to accomplish everything that God has set before you. Hey, I'm telling you, God is going to build his house. God is going to build his house. And that's you. That's your life. For those of you who have a mindset that I want to live a life according to the abundant life that Jesus died to give me. I want the overcoming life, the victorious life. I want the life of blessings. I want to have favor on my life. I want everything that I lay my hand to to prosper. I will, come on, say amen. I, I want that kind of life, the Jesus kind of life. And this message is for you. Because God said, I will build my house. Hallelujah. Zechariah chapter 2 and 10. You're in Zechariah. Turn there. Zechariah 2 and 10 says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. I'm so glad that we had church service this morning and God has dwelled in our midst during the praise and the worship and the prayer. And now the time of the preaching. Thank God that God is dwelling in our midst. But here's the good news. When you leave this building, you get to take him with you. He's dwelling in the midst. I said he's dwelling in the midst. Thank you, Lord. Our primary role as builders, no, no, as believers, is to be builders of the temple, right here, of our lives, to build a life in the image of the life of Jesus Christ. That's our role. That's our role. You say, Pastor, you're believing too big. No, I say, let's believe big. I'm believing that these hands will raise the dead. I'm believing that these feet will walk on water. I'm believing that this lifted hand in praise and worship will part the sea. I'm believing that this voice will be the voice of prophecy. I'm believing that these eyes will see the world come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm believing that the doors will be open and the favor will flow and the glory will fall. Yeah, I'm believing for it. I'm believing for it. I'm believing for that. I'm believing that God will build his house. Listen to me, church. If the Bible says these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, they'll cast out devils and they will speak with new tongues and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Hey, I'm a believer. Don't tell me I can't believe for that. I'm a believer. That's, that's the life I want God to build in me. Hallelujah. 
Oh, sing and rejoice. I'm going to dwell in the midst of you. Sing and rejoice. I'm going to dwell in the midst of you. Hallelujah. Now, God's going to build your life. God's going to build your life. But look at that. Look again in Zechariah 16. 1 and 16. He says, I, my house shall be built. He, he's emphatic. My house shall be built. But look, it's according to the surveyor's line. Listen, God is going to build your life according to his rule and measure, not according to yours. And that's a good thing. Because he'll do abundantly above all that we could ask or think. His measure is the height and the breadth and the width of the kind of life he wants you to have. It's life and life abundantly, Jesus said, because we think too small, we believe too small, we talk too small, our vision is too small. And so we end up with this little tiny image of a life that we think that we should have when God says, no, nah, just bust the lid off of that box. You get out of that box, you get into faith, and let me show you the surveyor's line that I've got. The measure of the life that I want you to have. The height of the life. Listen, I want these eyes to see into glory. Yes, I do. I want to be like Paul. I want to see in the heavenly realm. That's too much to ask. No, it is not. I want these eyes to see in the heavenly realm and I don't want to be dead when it happens. I want to be alive and kicking and see the glory of my Lord's throne room. Hey, 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 if, I, if Isaiah could say, I see the Lord high and lifted up and his train fills the temple. If, if Isaiah can say it, if John said, it in the, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and the Lord invited me up into the glory. If Paul can say, I knew a man that went up into the third heaven, saw things that are not even lawful to speak. Why not me? Why not me? Why not you? Why not? Hallelujah. Because the surveyor's measure for my life is much bigger than anything I could measure with. The height of what he wants me to achieve, the breadth of what he wants me to achieve, the depth of what he wants me to achieve is abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think. He will build this house. He will be, I'm on board. He will build this house. Amen. Hallelujah. My house, my life, my ministry, my purpose shall be built. I'm going to say that again. My house, my life, my purpose, my ministry shall be built. Write this in your notes, Philippians 1 and 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. What he started, he's going to finish. That good work, that good thing that he started in you. He is mindful to finish it. I'm not going to derail him. I'm not going to keep him from finishing. I'm on board. I tell you what, I'm on board with the will of God for my life. Praise the Lord. When David told Solomon that Solomon was going to build the, the temple of the Lord, he said in, in 1 Chronicles 28 and 20, he says, Be a be strong and of good courage and do it. Do not fear nor be dismayed for the Lord God. My God will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. I want you to know God is mindful of finishing that good work that he has started in you. The plan, the purpose, the desire that he has laid out for your life, he is fixed on finishing it. He said, I will build my house. And that is your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Can I have an amen? amen? How about a praise the Lord? How about a thank you, thank you, Jesus? Praise God. Amen. Zechariah 4 and 8. Are you still in Zechariah? If you're there, say, I'm there. Yes. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 8. Same. The hands of Zerubbabel. Now remember, Zechariah is the prophet, and the prophet is speaking about the governor, or the builder of the temple, Zerubbabel. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. And his hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, who has despised the day of small things. So what God has started, 
in your life, he is determined to finish in your life. I think that's a tremendous revelation of reassurance. You're not forgotten. You're not sidelined. God is on your side. He is on your team. He wants you to do all that he has called you to do. Amen. Amen. Here's the challenge. Well, there's a couple of challenges, but here's the first one. Here's the first one. In Zechariah 4 and 10, I just read it. For who has despised the day of small things? You see, so very often we look at the life that we were, are living and it just looks so small. When they started to build the temple after the captivity, Solomon's uh, temple had been destroyed by Babylon. The Babylonians had carried the children of Israel away. They had been gone for 70 years. Now they had come back and they're starting to rebuild. And you know what? They looked at what they were starting to rebuild and they said, this doesn't look anything like Solomon's temple. This doesn't look anything as good as Solomon's temple. And the great challenge when we face is when we start to look at our life and we say, this doesn't look so good. Uh, what I'm going through right now just isn't so great. Uh, uh, it doesn't measure up to what I thought it should be. And, and we start to be, begin to compare our, ourselves, just like they compared the new work of the temple with the old glorious Solomon's temple. And we begin to look and we say, you know what? It doesn't compare so hot. It, doesn't, it just doesn't look so hot. You know what? You've got to be very, com uh, very careful of what you compare your life to. Because comparisons are going to do one of three things. Either it's going to inspire you, and I pray that it will, or it's going to uh, invoke envy in you, or it's just going to discourage you. And so very often we look at successes here or there, and we say, uh-oh, my life doesn't measure up to that. And we get all discouraged, and we just quit trying altogether. You know what? They laid down the working of the temple for 14 years only to discover 14 years later that it only took four years to build it. When you get discouraged, when you start to compare, that's when you lose your courage and you lose the strength of your hands and the work of the Lord falls from your grip and you become aimless in your ways. You've got to be careful of how you look, how you look upon things. Now, Haggai was a prophet of the same uh, generation at the same time as Zechariah and this is what Haggai said in Haggai 2 and 3 you don't have to turn there but just write it in your notes he said who is left among you who saw this temple in his former glory in other words Solomon's temple and how do you see it now in comparison with it is this not in your eyes as nothing we, we can look at our life and say, this is nothing. I'm accomplishing nothing. I've arrived at nothing. Because we compare ourselves with such grand things and we just think, oh, I don't measure up to that. I'm too small for that. This, I, we begin to despise our small beginnings. Come on, church. We begin to despise our small beginnings, and then we, we fearfully, we quit at that point. But I want you to know that when God wanted to deliver the nation of Israel from Egypt, he used a baby in a bulrush. When God wanted to defeat a giant, a Philistine giant, he used a shepherd boy with a sling and a stone. When God wanted to feed the multitude, he used a little boy's lunch. And when God wanted to change the world for Jesus Christ, he put a calling on your life. Yeah, you say, I'm just a man. I'm just a woman. No, 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 no. You're the house of God. You're the building of the Lord. And when he wanted to change the world, he set his eyes on you and put a calling on you. He doesn't want you to look at yourself as small. You're a world changer. You're a world changer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Haggai goes on to say, he says, in, in your eyes, is it not as nothing? A couple of verses later, Haggai 2 and 9, he says, oh, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former temple. Oh, yeah, your tomorrows are going to be so much greater than your yesterdays. Your tomorrow. 
sorrows. Are, but see, the problem is that we judge our life by what we see in the moment, what we're going through right now. But that's not faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is not the substance of things we see right now. What we see right now is a vapor. It's a blink of the eye. It's passing away. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. I said of things hoped for. What are you hoping for? Why are we talking about what we see right now? We should be talking about faith, what we're hoping for in the future. Let me tell you, if you get on an elevator on the ground floor, but you want to be on the 10th floor, you don't keep pushing G. You don't keep pushing G because of that's what you see. That's where you're at. You don't keep talking ground floor talk. You need to push 10. If you want to go to 10, you need to see 10. Talk 10, live 10, leave 10. That's your hope. That's your desire. Got to get off the ground floor thinking. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't go by how things look right now. I said, don't go by how things look right now because that'll sink your boat. Hallelujah. And then there's another challenge, challenge number two, voices of opposition. And there's always voices of opposition, and usually they're right up here in our head. Too, too very often we're speaking against our own hope. Come on, say amen. amen. But God is speaking in favor of your hope. In Zechariah chapter 3, go back to Zechariah 3, verse 1. And then he showed me Joshua, Zechariah is having this prophetic vision. And then he showed me Joshua, the high priest. Now Joshua was the high priest during the time of the rebuilding of the temple. Zechariah, I mean Zerubbabel was the governor of Jerusalem. He was building it. And Joshua was the high priest. And so he is sort of a, a type and shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. Now, get that revelation, that when you are standing before the Lord, there is an accuser that stands right beside you, and he is running you down all the time. You know, there's voices of opposition running you down all, all the time. You don't have to look very far to find camps of folks that will speak against your hopes and your dreams and your desires and your visions. Certainly, Satan is trying to run us down all the time. You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not fast enough. You're not able enough. You're not this enough. You're not that enough. But listen... He'll run you down, and he is standing right beside you to do it. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The New Living Translation says, I, the Lord, reject your accusation, Satan. In other words, Satan is accusing Joshua. But the Lord breaks into that conversation and he says, hang on just a second. I don't believe a word you have to say. I don't agree with anything that you have to say. In fact, I reject your accusations and I rebuke you, Satan. I want you to know, you may think you're all by your Yourself. You may think nobody is on your side, but in the courtroom of glory, when the enemy is accusing you, the Lord is standing up on your behalf, and he says, I don't believe a word that you have to say. The blood of Jesus Christ covers them. They are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Zechariah 3 and 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Do you know the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy garments unto the Lord? As filthy garments. And was standing before the angel. Verse 4. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away these filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you. I will clothe you with rich robes. That's, that's a picture of the cross, that the, the, the filthiness of our sins have been taken off of Jesus, and Jesus has been clothed with the robes of righteousness. But I want you to know the filthiness of 
Your robes, your iniquity, your sin has been taken off of you as well because you were crucified with him. You've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. But here's the trick. Here's the key. You've got to understand this. God says, see, I have removed. You've got to see it. See, you've got to see it. See, I have removed your iniquity. And too very often, all we can see is our iniquity. And God says, you're looking at the wrong thing. I've taken it off. I've taken it away. I've removed that from your life. That's not part of your life anymore. Blood has covered you. Blood has washed you. Those, those filthy robes don't fit you anymore. That's not part of your life anymore. You got to see it. See, I have removed your iniquity from you. And I've clothed you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And so there's, the, there's always the challenge of, of our eyes. Things just don't look so good. But that's deceiving. And then there's the challenge of our ears, the voices that we hear. Things just don't sound so good. There's opposing voices to us saying that we're clothed in filthy Filthy rags. And the Lord says, no, no, you, you're seeing wrong. You're hearing wrong. I don't, I don't believe what they're accusing you with. And if you would just take another look at yourself, you would see that I've removed those filthy rags from your life and I've put on you rich robes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There's three secrets of building the temple of your life from Zechariah. Three secrets, real quick, three secrets. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 2. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I'm looking. And there's a lampstand of solid gold with a, bowl, with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at the left. So you see the, the golden lampstand symbolizing Jesus Christ, the, the uh, reserve of oil on top of the lampstand uh, symbolizing the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then beside them are two olive trees. And then continuing on in verse 11, and then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at the left? And I further asked him and said to him, what are these two olive branches that dip into the receptacles of the gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? And then he said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, Lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Now, scholars will tell you that this is probably symbolism of Joshua, the, the priestly realm, and Zerubbabel, the uh, kingly realm, or it might be the two witnesses, a reference to the two witnesses in Revelation, uh, Elijah and Enoch, those who have never died, that will be witnesses in the last days in, in the book of Re Revelation. But I really pondered on this, and, and I, I believe that the Holy Spirit ministered something to me regarding the building of our house, the building of our life because I was mindful that the lampstand is in the holy place in the temple. This is something that sits in the, the holy, uh, not the holy of holies, that's the ark, but the holy place of the temple is the lampstand. But the lampstand is not by itself. Across from the lampstand is the table of showbread, which represents the word of God. Uh, Jesus is the, the bread of heaven, but he said that that uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4. And so we understand that the, the bread is, symbolizes Jesus as the word. But then there's also the altar of incense. And those are the prayers of the saints that are constantly going up before the Lord. They're called the sweet savor of the saints going up before the Lord. So standing on either side of the, the lamp is the showbread or the word and the prayers of the saints. I believe that it is essential in building the life that God would have you to have, 
building this temple. There has to be a, an anointed approach to the Word of God and to prayer. And I believe that if we're going to build the life God wants us to have, we've got to have a whole new approach to the Word of God. Amen. Come on, say amen. amen. And a whole new approach to prayer. Come on, say amen. amen. I think it's so interesting that the, the branches of the olive trees are supplying the, the oil to the lamppost, are supplying oil to the lamppost. And the Word of God and the prayers, anointed prayers of the saint, are a supply line that connects you connect you to the Lord. Jesus said in John 15, he said, he that abides in me and my word abides in him. If he asks anything, I will do it. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, if you ask anything, I will do it. When the word of God becomes an instrument of anointing in your life, I heard an illustration uh, Sonny told this to me, and I, I hope I say it back right, Sonny. But Sonny said when it comes to uh, electrical supplies, if, the, if your neighborhood supply line, your, the lines of electricity go down, and you run out and you start a generator, what you're doing when you start that generator is you're pushing electricity back into the line. So it, you're not getting fed by the city anymore. Now you're feeding the city. Okay, follow me now. You're not being fed by the city anymore. You are, are supplying back to the city. So the line man has to be very careful when he hooks it back up that the supply isn't coming from the other end anymore or he'll get shocked. You understand? When you are in anointed study of the word, anointed use of the word, anointed prayer. That's when your supply starts to get added back into the system. When you're under the anointing of the Holy, this is how it happens. When you're under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and you start speaking the word of God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden you're adding your supply back into the system. When you're praying under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and you're giving voice to your prayers praying in tongues praying under the anointing that's when you're adding your supply back into the system that's how prayer moves mountains that's how prayer changes things when your supply Starts getting back into the system. I'm talking about the miracle system. Ooh. Hallelujah. Someone say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Number two, if you want to build your life, build this temple, build your life. Number two is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is our text, Zechariah 4 and 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the, Lord's of, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. So it's not by military might. That word might means an army. It's not by military might. It's not by human power, but it's by my spirit. You know, there's, there's really three ways to do anything for God. You can do it in your ability, you can do it in the world's ability, or you can do it in God's ability. Your ability and the wor world's ability might look nice at the beginning and have some sparkle to it along the way, but it won't last. It won't, it won't make a dent in anything. It won't amount to nothing. It'll, it'll all be whiz-bang. But if you do it in God's ability, I said if you do it in God's ability, then you have eternal effects. It's not by might. You see, Solomon built a mighty and a wonderful temple, but he had the riches of his kingdom to do it. David, his father, had conquered many lands. He had the treasuries of all these different lands that he had conquered. He had an army. He had craftsmen. He had materials. He had everything that he could have need of. He had a citizenry that wanted to contribute to the building of the temple. He had everything that you could imagine. Zerubbabel had none of these. And Zerubbabel looked around. He said, I have no army to conquer a land to raise money. I have no power or ability. Uh, political ability, human ability to raise 
funds. I have no craftsmen. I, I don't have anything to do this. And God says, don't worry about it. You got me. Yeah, it's not by might. Let, let me tell you, friends, you, you look at your life and you say, man, I, I just don't have what I don't think I have what it takes to, to do all that God has called me to do. Hey, you got God. I said, you got God. I'm going to say it again. You got God. And if God be for you, who can be against you? With God on your side, you're, you have a winning combination right there. And that's why the Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth, he says, When I was with you, I was with you in weakness and in fear. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. And in much trembling. But verse 4, he says, My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. He says, It was not by might. It's not by power. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul got this principle principle down. He got that revelation down. And Paul changed the world forever. And he's still changing the world unto the coming of Jesus Christ. One man said, I can't preach. I don't have enticing words of human wisdom. I'm not a great orator, but what I do know is the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm not going to try and tickle your ears. I'm going to try and change your life through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he not only changed the lives of those who are around him, he changed nations continually and on and on and on and on through his ministry unto the coming of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And if you can believe it, Jesus did exactly the same thing. Jesus didn't raise an army. In fact, Jesus refused an army. He said, don't you know I could have called legions? There's armies at my disposal, he says. He didn't use armies. He didn't use human might either. For those that were gathered around him certainly were not strong. They were demonstrated their human frailty quite a bit. But the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. He understood what spiritual power was. And I think we need to understand what spiritual power is. I think we understand, need to understand what the anointing of the Holy Spirit is once again. And then finally, the third method and means by which we can build the Christian life, the believer's life, the abundant life that we desire to have is with shouts of grace, grace to it. In Zechariah 4 and 7, it says that he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. This is a tremendous revelation because in those days a dignitary would lay the, the cornerstone or foundation stone of any building and that would be the start of it. And then at the very end, the very last stone that would complete the project, the capstone, he would put the capstone on the very top of it. When the foundation stone was laid of the temple, no, nobody was shouting glory about it. They were all thinking, this looks pretty bad. But when the capstone was finally lowered upon it, they're all shouting grace, grace to it. Let me tell you something about your life. Right now, it may not look so great. Right now, it might not be all that hot in your eyes. But when Jesus, the chief cornerstone and capstone of your life, the author and the finisher of your faith, the alpha to the omega of your life, when he caps your life off with the capstone, you just should be shouting grace to it, grace to it. One translation says, God bless it, God bless it. Another translation says, beauty and perfection, beauty and perfection. That's what you should be shouting over your life every single day. You should be saying grace to my life, grace to my life, God bless my life, God bless my life. Beauty and perfection in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Declaring grace and blessings and favor as the capstones of our life. But this is the verse I'm going to close on. Zechariah 4 and 8. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, 
saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. We build our life through word and prayer and spiritual anointing and declarations of grace. But you know, ultimately, it's up to you. What, Zach, what Zerubbabel has started, Zerubbabel had to finish. And you have to decide what God's going to ha- do in your life. God's on board. God, God has a measuring stick and, and wants to build bigger and broader and higher and lower than you could ever imagine. But you just have to get on board with that. You have to say, yes, Lord, grace unto it, grace unto it, grace unto it. And even when it doesn't look so hot in your eyes, you need to refute that. Uh, the, the, the latter's going to be greater than the former. And when it doesn't sound so good in your ears, you need to disagree with that, knowing that God is falling out of agreement with all of your accusers, that God is not going to refute the calling that is upon your life. I say grace unto it, grace unto it, grace unto it. Say it with me one time, grace. Say it again, grace unto it. Come on, say it again, grace unto it. Will you stand with me? Did you get anything out of this today? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.